Good evening, everybody. Glad that you could join us uh, this evening. This is uh, Wednesday, October 28th service at New Testament Baptist Church. My name is Pastor Ken Parrott, and uh, we are on the book of uh, Luke, Gospel of Luke. We've been doing the Life of Christ study. And uh, so anyway, we kind of completed, we spent a lot of time in Luke 16, verses 19 to 31, and uh, many, many weeks. If you want to um, uh, go back, if you haven't watched those messages um, concerning hell, uh, they're very important messages, I believe, especially number one for those who are lost, but also for those who are saved to remind themselves of the blessings of salvation and what we have been saved from, amen? And uh, so anyway, uh, go back, go on the YouTube channel, Life of Christ, you'll see them, and there's different aspects that we've covered here. But tonight, uh, and again, apologize, we don't have any congregational music tonight, um, but anyway, we'll get to the lesson tonight. And uh, what we're going to look at, there's um, different qualities of uh, discipleship, and they're mentioned. You really want to be a true follower of Jesus Christ tonight. Uh, you're going to find uh, some basic aspects of discipleship in these verses. We're going to look at the first 10 verses. Uh, we've already covered the 10 lepers. If you look the last week or two in our Sunday school hour, I covered that. Uh, so when we get to that, uh, Lord willing, uh, next week, uh, we will um, not cover that. We've already covered it. So I, I ask you to go back into the Sunday School playlist, and you'll see that. So let me read the passage to you tonight, and then what I'll do is um, I will pray, and we'll get into the message tonight. Then said he unto the disciples, again, Luke 17, verse 1, Luke 17, verse 1. Then said he unto the disciples, it is impossible, that's a very important statement, but that offenses will come, but woe unto him through whom they come. It were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck, and he cast into the sea, than that he should offend one of these little ones. Take heed to yourselves. If thy brother, your brother, trespass against thee, rebuke him. And if he repent, forgive him. Verse 4, and if he trespass against thee seven times in a day. How about that? And seven times in a day turn again to thee, saying, notice he's saying this, that's important, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. And the apostles said unto the Lord, increase our faith. In verse Six And the Lord said, If ye had faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye might say unto this sycamine tree, Be thou plucked up by the root, and be thou planted in the sea, and it should obey you. Verse 7, But which of you, having a, a servant plowing or feeding cattle, will say unto him by and by, when he has come from the field, Go and sit down to meat? And will not rather say unto him, Make ready wherewith I may sup, and gird thyself, and serve me, till I have eaten and drunken, and afterward thou shalt eat and drink? Doth he thank that servant, because he did the things that were commanded him? I trow not. So likewise ye, when ye shall have done all these things which are commanded you, say, We are unprofitable servants. We have done that which was our duty to do. Let's pray and we'll get to the message tonight. Father, again, thank you for your word. Thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, God, for the truth. And Father, pray, thank you tonight for salvation. Now, Father, we do pray and ask you tonight that you would work in the hearts of folks that will be watching this message, Lord God. Lord God, meet with their needs, especially those who, who don't know you as personal Savior. We pray for believers, Lord God, that we would learn these lessons of discipleship tonight. So very, very important lessons, Lord. So God, touch people's hearts, fill me and use me tonight, and we'll thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. 
Okay, well, listen, let's get into this here um, tonight. And uh, just a kind of a, a little bit of a refresher. Um, what we've covered since chapter 14, if you kind of go back in your Bible, uh, the Sabbath day uh, began on chapter 14. So all of these things that you read in chapter 14, 15, 16, and 17 are all, again, continuing this long Sabbath day of teaching that Jesus had. Amen? So we're going to look at uh, four qualities of true discipleship or of those who uh, claim to follow Jesus Christ. Amen? If you're a follower of Christ, I then say if you're saved, um, you know, you need Christ for salvation. After you're saved, you need to grow in grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And uh, you learn. You, you, there's things that you need to learn. And uh, so as we go, as we grow in grace, uh, these aspects that we'll mention tonight should come into play. So in verse 1 and 2, the first thing we're going to look at is uh, offending others. Offending others. Offensive offenses. Look at verse 1. Then said he unto the disciples... Um, it is impossible, but that offenses will come, but woe unto him through whom they come. In verse 2, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he cast into the sea than that he should offend one of these little ones. So Jesus said, he's speaking to his disciples, he says it's impossible. Do you know what? It's inevitable. You're going to be offended. Um, you know, I, I, I think sometimes that people when they come to know Jesus Christ, I think many times uh, we need to be careful as we lead others to Christ that we don't give them the impression that now all your problems are gone, now that you're saved. Can I say this? You're going to now um, realize that that is not true very quickly. Um, shortly after I got saved, I began to realize uh, some of those things. You thought, oh no, everybody would just embrace the gospel and be so glad that you've received Jesus Christ as your Savior. No, not everybody. Not everybody's all that excited about the new you. Some of the people in this world, in your workplace, in your school, in your family, friends, and relatives, and neighbors, uh, some of them preferred the old you, the old worldly you. Now that you're saved, God's transforming and changing your life. They don't like those changes. But the Lord tells us as believers, we're going to be offended. And we need to be strong, strong in the Lord. Amen? We will be offended. People will be offended. But the Bible says, he tells us here, it's, imp it's impossible to not be live this life and not be offended. So that's what Jesus is saying here, amen? You know what? Uh, the only time we're ever going to be free from offenses in this world is when we get to heaven, when the Lord takes us out of here. So we got to learn some things. we got to learn some things. Um, so in this case, he's saying at the end of verse 1, but woe unto him through whom they come. In other words, as believers... Yes, you will, number one, be offended. People will offend you. But number two, Jesus says, woe unto that one that causes the offense, that causes that stumbling block. You'll see that throughout the Scriptures. You know, there's so many things in, that the Bible talks about. As a matter of fact, over in Romans chapter 14, let me just turn there for a moment. Romans chapter 14, the Bible says, um, in Romans chapter 14, him that is weak in the faith, uh, receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. For one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. In verse 3, let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not, and let not him that eateth not judge him that eateth, for God hath received him. For who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth, Yea, he shall be holding up, for God is able to make him stand. And the Bible talks about that people would be offended. 
But then he says here that as believers, God does not want us to be a stumbling block to someone else. Skip down to verse 13. Let us not therefore judge one another anymore, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. You know, I remember years ago, I learned early as a Christian that there are certain things that we need to be careful with. And one of them is this. Um, when I deliver the truth of the Word of God, um, I know that people will be offended. Well, I do not apologize for my position in Jesus Christ. Uh, if I'm preaching, teaching the truth in love, trying to reach out and help people, and people get offended by that, that is not my fault. The Bible even tells us, Jesus said in his earthly ministry, that people were offended at him. How could we blame Jesus Christ for doing anything wrong? He was sinless. He was perfect. But there's one thing that we should apologize for, and that's this. Not our position, as long as we deliver it, uh, that truth in love, but our disposition, our attitude, our spirit, how we deliver that. And uh, so it's important for us that we be careful with that. Amen? So I don't, I don't know about you, but I don't want to, I don't want to be the one that causes offenses um, to people, but I want to build people up. I don't want to be a, how can I say, a stumbling block, but I want to be a stepping stone for others. I want to help people, amen? And he says, so woe unto him through whom they come. And uh, so um, then he says in that passage there, for it were, verse 2, better for him that a millstone. How about that? A millstone. How about that? You ever seen a millstone? Those big old millstones they used in the mills to grind uh, the grain and all that? They're heavy. They're big. How, how about if you'd like to have one of those hanged about your neck? Man, I'll tell you, you get cast into the sea, you're going down. You are not coming up. He says it would be better. It would be better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck. You know, um, we as believers, if you've been saved for any length of time, you need to remember something. Um, maybe as a believer, when you first came to Christ, you grew quickly. Well, listen, not everybody's going to grow in the same time frame that you've grown as a believer. And we must show people grace. As long as people are striving and learning and growing and we're allowing the Holy Spirit of God to work in their lives, we need to give people that liberty, amen, and let people grow in grace. And uh, so, and again, I just don't want to be that one that will cause someone to fall or stumble, amen? And uh, so anyway, the first thing again is offensive offenses. So, Again, I want to be a stepping stone, not a stumbling block. Amen? So number two here, number two, again, the first thing was offensive offenses. Okay? Number two, forever forgiving. Forever forgiving. Verses three and four talk about forgiveness. And forgiveness, I've, I have messages I have preached in the past. I don't know if I have them on YouTube I've preached them here in the church. I've preached them out on the road uh, when I've preached in other churches. It's so important for us to understand the principle of forgiveness. And so let's look at this passage in verses 3 and 4. Take heed to yourselves. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him, and if he repent, forgive him. And if he trespass against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day turn again to thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. So let's, let's think about this. So let's not disconnect verses 1 and 2. Let's say you're the one, okay, who has been offended. Okay, he says, if thy brother trespass against thee. He says, now rebuke him. So if someone stumbles you, what Jesus is saying, you need to deal with it, and you need to seek that person out. And the Bible says that if he, uh, he says, 
I repent, amen, you're supposed to forgive him. You're supposed to forgive him. And uh, so, look at this. So, if thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. You know, there's times we need to rebuke others. And again, in the proper spirit, the Bible even tells us in the book of Proverbs, uh, the, the wounds of a friend. Some people say, well, I would never, ever say anything, um, uh, you know, in the spirit of, even in the spirit of grace and love to kind of correct my brother and sister in Christ. No, you ought to do that. The Bible, Jesus even says here, if someone's trespass against you, rebuke them. Rebuke them. There's a time of rebuke. People don't understand it. But, verse 3, if he repents, you're supposed to forgive him. You're supposed to forgive them. And verse 4, if a trespass, if he trespass against thee seven times in a day. How about that? What if that took place where this dear brother caused you to stumble seven times in one day? And seven times in a day he turns around. What is he doing? He's saying, he's saying this, I repent. Jesus said, you're supposed to forgive him. You're supposed to forgive him. This is the challenge that we have, and it's tough. It's forgiveness. It's forgiveness. It's easier to hold grudges. The flesh just wants you to do that. The flesh wants you to, to hang on to it and hang these, these times and these moments um, uh, that people have done things and said things to you and just hang on to them and allow those things to be something that you have against someone else instead of letting them go. The Bible talks about forgiveness. And when we talk about forgiveness, it's an actual full release. You know, forgiveness, when you come and you study the Scriptures, you'll understand that a lot of terminology is, can be related to finances. We talk about reconciliation. Forgiveness is on the same thing. It comes from a Latin word, remitto. Remit, no, when we release, release money, you know, in the sense of uh, remittances um, and uh, so in finances. And forgiveness is a full release, just moving on, release. If the person repents, we need to forgive them. I've seen too much over the years as pastor where people have hung on to certain hurts and didn't let them go. They thought that that would hurt the person that offended them, but Ed actually ended up destroying themselves because they wouldn't release. They wouldn't let it go. He says seven times a day. So we notice here Jesus is giving a command. The command is forgiveness. Aren't you glad that at the cross Jesus said, one of the seven sayings of the cross was, Jesus said this, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Can you think about what he went through? Can you study the Gospels? Can you study the Old Testament prophecies, especially Isaiah 52 and 53, where even it says that in Isaiah 52, if you would have seen Christ after he was uh, tortured and, and put to that cross, you know what? He did not even look like a human being anymore. But yet, on the cross, Jesus says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. What a classic case of forgiveness. I would dare say that the average situation that maybe you tonight have dealt with doesn't even come close to what Christ went through. And the Bible tells us, go over to Ephesians 4. We'll come, we'll come back to Luke 17 passage. Ephesians chapter 4. Sometimes it takes years people get over stuff. Meanwhile, they've wasted a lot of time because unforgiveness is a sin. If someone has asked for forgiveness, they've repented, you're supposed to forgive. You're not supposed to hang on to it. In Ephesians 4, verse 30, the Bible says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, that means you got to do this. God's not going to take away the bitterness. You must allow God you must allow the Lord, you must allow this flesh of yours to release that bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And he says this in verse 32, and be kind one to another, 
tenderhearted, forgiving one another. Sometimes we stop there, but let's read on. Did you see those last, that last phrase? Even as God, for Christ's sake. So that's an interesting statement. Even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. You know what? God forgave us because of Jesus and what he did. It's not us. Because of what Jesus went through, he paid for our sins, God forgives us. Amen? So, what's the principle? In Christ, we can forgive. If you're saved tonight, in Jesus Christ, you can forgive if you really want to. You, can't, you cannot say as a believer, I cannot forgive that person. If they've repented, you can forgive them. If you want to. It's a heart matter in your place. Amen? So, we shouldn't offend people when it comes to on our disposition side of things, in our position, as long as we spoke the truth in love, they're offended, that's not your fault. But if you've been offended and that person repents and seeks forgiveness, you're supposed to forgive. There's no limit. There's no limit. Amen? It's forever forgiving. Forever forgiving. So let's, let's read on here. And that there, um, go down to verse 5, up back to Luke 17. So not only do we have offensive offenses, not only do we have forever forgiving, these are quality traits of a true follower of Jesus Christ, a disciple of Jesus Christ. Amen? Number three is mountain-moving faith. Mountain-moving faith. And what we're going to see in a few moments here, there's also a correlation to faith in, this, in verses 1 through 10 of Luke 17. Mountain-moving faith. Can I say this? Based on what Jesus already said, he says, you're going to be offended. But woe unto that person who does the offending. Amen? That does the offending that causes someone to stumble in their faith. Woe unto that person. And then he switches gears and he says, now what if you've been offended? You're the one who stumbled. Okay? Now he says, if that person that caused you to stumble comes to you, then you need to forgive them if they repent. And then these statements in verses 5 and 6 come into play. Here's what Jesus says. And the apostles said unto the Lord, after they heard these four verses, these, these statements in the first four verses of this chapter, he says that they say this, increase our faith. Did you get that? See, sometimes we think, we're thinking when we think of matters of faith, you know, we're thinking of opening up the Red Sea. We're thinking about, you know, all these miracles we read about in the Old Testament. By the way, God is still the God of miracles. Um, he can do anything. Uh, he's not dead. He's alive. Um, also, I think we also minimize salvation in a sense that every time someone gets saved, that's a miracle in itself. But let me ask you something else. The statement that the disciples are making or the, the, the asking the Lord Jesus after they've heard these statements already is we need to increase our faith if we're going to do what you just said, Jesus. Yeah. You know how you increase your faith? Well, first of all, this passage here tells us, it's very clear, they just ask, Lord, increase our faith. So one way that you can increase your faith is through prayer. Through prayer. The next way that you can increase your faith Keep your place there in Luke 17. Look at Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10, verse 17. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Did you get that? So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Do you know how you can increase your faith? Number one, you ask. That's what they're doing in Luke 17. Number two is you fill your heart and your mind with the Word of God. 
Spend time in prayer. Spend time in the Word of God. If we're going to have the victories that God said He already gave us the moment we got saved, if we're going to realize those things in our life, then we cannot harbor unforgiveness. We cannot cause brothers and sisters in Christ to stumble. And he said, the disciples said, you know what, that takes a lot of faith to do what you just said, Jesus. It does. So instead of thinking about this great big, you know, a lot of times we're kind of stuck on the material things of life, and again, to pray for material things, as I've said so many times in my messages, is not wrong. Pray for health, not wrong. These are matters, yes. But many times our, our prayers are, are focused on ourself, and especially about physical being, our health and wealth, material things. A lot of our prayers. And we really are shy on prayers about spiritual matters. As a matter of fact, I've said, and I've even preached messages in the past. I even have a handout, and if you want it, just message me through this YouTube channel. Uh, it'll take you through our page or whatever. I'll send you this. The majority of prayers that the Apostle Paul prayed in the New Testament were for the spiritual well-being of others. We're talking about spiritual prayers, not about material prayers. There's only one time Paul prayed, and he prayed that the Lord would remove a thorn in his flesh. No one knows for sure what that is, and many have kind of thought, well, it could be whatever, you know, you fill in the blank. You know, I won't be dogmatic on what it is. Who knows what it is? But whatever it was, it was enough that Paul said to the Lord, Lord, take away this thorn in the flesh. And the Bible says that when he prayed that, the Lord said that three times. He said, no, Paul, you're going to have to live with that problem, whatever it is. You know what? There's some things God does say no. We got some people out there in different Christian circles that think that God says yes to everything. No, he doesn't. And by the way, that's the way some of you are as parents. You never say no. We read about that in one of David's sons, Adonijah. The Bible says he never displeased his son. Sometimes you got to say no to your kids. I believe the average child today is spoiled rotten. They're spoiled. You go back a couple of generations. We didn't listen. I'm of born in the 50s. I was happy with a lot less than what kids here today are grumbling about. We have so much, so much, and it hasn't helped us spiritually. Giving your kids everything, all the material things. You know what? It's important for people to appreciate what they got. And I don't think this modern day age generation really appreciates everything that they have. Constantly grumbling and complaining. So increase your faith. Spend time in the Word and prayer. Another thing that we can relate to, you go over to Malachi chapter 3. We'll come back to Luke 17, the last book of the Old Testament. And it's interesting, the Lord makes a statement in Malachi. And I want you to think about this. He talks about giving there. He talks about giving. And back in, let's see here, verse 10, bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be meat in mine house. Now watch this. Prove me now, herewith saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. I want you to think about proving God. As we spend time in prayer, we spend time in the Word of God, God reveals things, we get closer to God. As Psalm 37 talks about verse 4, Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. We are closer in tune with the Lord. Our prayers will be more hits than misses. James chapter 2 says we shouldn't pray amiss. 
John 15, verse 7 says, If ye abide in me, my words abide in you. Ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. So as we stay close to God, stay in prayer, stay in tune with the Lord, we'll be in tune with the will of God. We'll know what God wants. And our prayer life will be so much more effective. But we've got to increase our faith. It would do us all well tonight to spend less time on social media and on the news media. I read that verse over in Romans 14. Doubtful disputations. There's things that are not very clear in Scripture, and there's things that are doubtful, and they cause disputations. And we're not talking about things that are clear in Scripture. You know, stuff like this on the Internet, all these conspiracy theories, are they all true? You'd be better served to spend more time on the Word of God than sharing all these different conspiracy theories. Who knows if they're true or not? You need to spend more time in the truth. The truth will increase your faith. It will decrease your anxiety and your worry and your fear. It's sad today to see so many Christians so engrossed. You know, it's just a diversion. It's just a distraction for believers to talk about the, what's on the news, and what is on social media. Listen, tonight, you need to spend time on the Word. Some of us are more consumed with, oh, look at this, this may be a, a fulfillment of prophecy. How about your forgiveness tonight? Have you offended somebody? Maybe you need to go to them and ask them for forgiveness. Man, I'll tell you, we're so... We're, we're thinking about things that really, really don't amount to anything in eternity. Meanwhile, the stuff that really matters is like, let's settle some things between brothers and sisters in Christ. And the disciples said, increase our faith. Are you going to prove God? That passage in Malachi 3 that we, I just mentioned there, Lord says, listen, in this matter of giving, you know, when we give, we need to trust God by faith. We give. We give um, because we recognize God's blessed us and we, got, we received it from the hand of God and we, we return it back to His hand. It, it's His. If you understand giving in the Bible, you don't own anything. We're all stewards. And we ought to be grateful and thankful that God's given us the breath of life and the strength to go to work, to earn an income, and to turn around. And yes, we ought to remember God However frequency you get paid, remember God and what He's blessed you with. Amen? And you need to extend yourself and reach out and be a blessing. Take care, number one, remember God. Take care of your family. 1 Timothy 5, 8 talks about if you don't provide for your own, you're worse than an infidel, an unbeliever, a lost person. So you need to do that. Then if you, got, if you, take, if you give it, you, rem you remembered God, you've taken care of your family, then maybe you have some other areas that you like to be a help and blessing to others. You can extend yourself, amen? And you know what? God says, why don't you just prove me now? Why don't you just prove me now? Why don't you just trust God? And when you see God work in a real way, it will encourage you and increase your faith. Just like prayer, asking, God, increase my faith. Spend time in the Word. Understand. God ask the Holy Spirit to help you understand what you're reading. Spend time in the Word. Spend more time in the Word of God than on social media and the news media. And then prove God. Amen? That's how we increase our faith. Look at verse 5 again. Back in Luke 17, and the apostles said unto the Lord, increase our faith. And the Lord said, if ye had faith as a grain of mustard seed, you might say unto the sycamine tree, be thou plucked up by the root, and be thou planted in the sea, and it should obey you. Now you just got to think about this, amen? The issue isn't, how can I say it? It, it we, we need to increase that faith, increase our faith. And faith is like a seed. He even relates it to a seed. He says, if you have the faith as a grain of mustard seed, what is a mustard seed? It's something that's small, 
But do you know what's so special about it? It has life in it. You know, you planted things in the spring. You've reaped a harvest already, and that's pretty much done, I believe. If it's cultivated, it will grow and increase in power. You know what? That's what God wants. God wants to accomplish great things in our lives tonight. He really does. So do you have that mountain-moving faith? You know, I, this little story here I found, I've heard it before, and I thought I'd share it with you tonight before we go on to the last point. A man who was buried in a tomb that requested a great mass of granite over the top of his grave when he died, he had said, if there ever was a resurrection, it might be certain he should never rise. I don't want to rise. <laughs> the granite stone weighing tons is there, but split in two. Before they could place the large granite stone on the grave, a bird happened to drop an acorn right there. An acorn sprang up, and the living power of the acorn split the granite in two. It was small and weak, but the difference was it has life. It has life. Jesus says, you know what? That little mustard seed, we, a lot can be done with that, but it has life. Amen? So, as we've looked at these three things, offensive offenses. Have you offended somebody? Amen? Have you caused someone to stumble? You need to deal with that. The Lord said, amen, um, woe unto you. <laughs> Through whom they come, everybody will be offended. You will face offenses. And if that person in verses 5 or in 3 and 4 comes to you and says, no, I'm sorry, I know I offended you, and I want you to forgive me, I am sorry, I repent, you know what you're supposed to do? Forgive them. Even if it happens seven times in a day, that's forever forgiving. Then we saw in verses 5 and 6, mountain-moving faith. So Jesus made the connection to the matter of faith concerning, let's go on. You know, even if the person, if you've been offended, let's say that person, you never get to deal with that thing. Let's say you just you can't meet up with them and you never see them again. The Lord says, you know what? It's all a matter of faith. It's all a matter of faith. Increase your faith. Increase your faith. So, and the mountain moving faith. So, when we get down to the nitty gritty, there's actually four lessons of faith contained in these ten verses. Number one, faith to be stepping stones and not stumbling blocks. That's verses one and two. Verses 3 and 4, faith to forgive. Verses 5 and 6, faith is unleashed. You can see what God can do with a little. I like that song, little is much when God is in it. God can do so much. We think we need to have something, something big and a lot of whatever it is we're thinking about. God can make, do a lot with one person. God could do a lot with a small group of people. Do you know, I've mentioned this in my messages, some people think the people that change the world are the majority. It's not. You study history. The, the people that have been instrumental in changing our society and our world are the vocal minority, not the silent majority. It's a vocal minority. You are special to God tonight. God wants to use you tonight. And you and God are a majority tonight. Amen? And now we're going to see, last of all, verses 7 to 10, the duty of servants, or if in the relation back to that matter of faith, faith to serve. So faith to be stepping stones and not stumbling blocks. Faith to forgive. Faith is unleashed and seeing what God can do. Amen? Increasing your faith. And faith to serve. I want you to see this here. And a very, very important principle is taught here. But which of you, verse 7 in Luke 17, having a servant plowing or feeding cattle, will say unto him by and by, when he has come from the field, go and sit down to the meat? 
In other words, this person's worked hard all day, and the Jewish day was 12 hours a day. Jesus said, are there not yet 12 hours in a day? So 12 hours you have. And so anyway, and he said, will not rather say unto him, make ready wherewith I may sup and gird thyself and serve me till I have eaten and drunk, and afterward thou shalt eat and drink. So he's saying, listen, do you think when he comes back, if the servants come back in from working out all day long, that this, the master is going to say to him that, oh, you can go ahead and sit down. You've worked hard all day. No, 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 their job's not done. He says, now I want you to take care of me. That's an anticipate an expectation. And then after he's done all that, they've worked hard all day. They prepared a meal. They've served the master. Verse 9, doth he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded him? I trow not. Verse 10, so likewise ye, when ye have done all those things which are commanded you, say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done that which was our duty to do. I have seen a big change here in the last for sure 20, 30 years. It's unreal. It is unreal. I'd like to take an example of the workplace. It used to be, when I was in the workplace over, well, when I first came to Nova Scotia, I worked a little bit uh, in the uh, Southwest Nova there for a couple of years. But even more prior to that, back in Ontario, worked in a machine shop, worked with janitorial maintenance uh, businesses, worked at Kodak, but it used to be that if you showed up on time, you showed up for work and you showed up on time, you didn't get rewarded for that. Doing your duty, you, you're, you, you got hired and you're, you've been given your schedule and showing up on time, or showing up, number one, and showing up on time is rewarded. We were not rewarded for that. We were rewarded for working harder, going the extra mile, doing extra things that weren't required of us or commanded by us. See, we're living in a day and age, it seems like everybody is supposed to be rewarded just for showing up for work. Isn't that a sad day that we're living in? You know what? According to Jesus Christ, you're just doing your duty if you just show up for work. That's good, show up for work. But yet, there are people who will even take a job and won't even show up, show up the first day. How about that? Talk about a lack of character today in our society. Or, they, they will show up for work maybe the first day, and maybe that will last for a while, and then they're late for work. And then it becomes a regular thing. Can't even show up on time. That's a lack of character. It's a lack of character. You know, so in this passage, so we talk about faith. There's a lot. Faith can help us get through, um, you know, if we've been offended. Um, faith can help us uh, to not offend others. Faith can help us to forgive when the offender repents. Faith uh, can give us the power and strength to do some great things, which includes forgiving, the first verses three and four, amen, and not offending. But what it can do also is this. What it is is it's just day-to-day -day ordinary serving God. That's what it is. This In verses seven through 10, this is the day-to-day run-of-the-mill back in Christ's day in 30 AD, what people went through. They worked hard, they worked hard. Uh, you know, like I said a few moments ago, 12-hour days. How about six 12-hour days? 72-hour work week. By the way, if you work the six 12s, even as the Lord said that man was supposed to work six days and rest on the seventh, you know what? It's a, it's a good principle that you take one day off in seven. Can you imagine if you work six 12-hour shifts? There's no way. Listen, we're all flesh here, but that would surely reduce the amount of trouble people can get themselves into because you'd be really worn out. You don't have time to mess around with anything. 
working hard like that. And by the way, if you haven't worked six twelves according in Old Testament and Bible standards, <laughs> I'm telling you, there was something wrong. That's how people worked, unless they had some physical condition that they couldn't work. So, day to day, it may not be exciting. Going out in the fields, taking care of the cows, working in the barn, taking care of the master, making the meals. That may not have been all that exciting, but it's important. It's important. It's important. And you know what? God says, one thing is for sure. And here's the principle. We ought to do the things that we're doing. And we, and we ought to do the things that God commanded us. As a matter of fact, keep your place there. We're going to wrap up shortly here in Joshua. Joshua. And in Joshua chapter, let's see. I didn't write in my notes, so hopefully I don't get sidetracked here. Joshua chapter 11, verse 15. I love this passage. I, I remind our folks a lot about this. Joshua eleven fifteen. As the Lord commanded Moses' his servant... So did Moses command Joshua. So as we know that God called uh, Moses from that burning bush, God had a plan for him when he was born. And uh, so what happened was, of course, Moses trained Joshua. Uh, he mentored um, Joshua. And the Bible says, so as the Lord commanded, so God told Moses, he gave him the commands. Moses relayed that to Joshua and the Bible says, so did Joshua. So it's important to know the truth, but it's also important to obey the truth. That's like what James talks about. You know, not just be a hearer of the word, but doers of the word. So God told Moses, he commanded him. Moses took that, transferred that to Joshua and said, here, here's what I want to teach you. Here's, and he said, the Bible tells us the commentary here is, so did Joshua. So did Joshua. And here's the passage I want you to think about. He left nothing undone of all that the Lord commanded Moses. By the way, that's not a statement of sinlessness. It's just a sta statement of fact. He obeyed God. You know, we, have, we get so tied down, or we get so bogged down with things that are not as important. They weren't as, they're not commanded. For instance, Let's make it very basic and simple. God wants you to spend time in prayer and in the Word. Those are important. The Bible says, as newborn babes, 1 Peter 2, 2 uh, desire the sincere milk of the Word that you may grow thereby. So God wants you to spend time in the Word, to read it, to study it, to meditate upon it. So people can get bogged down with doing all kinds of things, but yet maybe a day or two or three or more passes by, you haven't even opened up the Bible. You haven't spent time in prayer. And there's other matters that we can talk about. Joshua left nothing undone that was commanded by God. He did what he was supposed to do. According to Jesus Christ in Luke 17, should we... If you do, if your kids do what they're supposed to do, that's expected. How about them going the extra mile and doing more, working harder to do more, not just settle for, I'm just going to meet the minimum requirements here. That's the way a lot of people are. I'll just do the bare bones necessities. I don't want to do any more, probably less, but no more than that. And it's sad. It is sad. It says we're unprofitable servants. Unprofitable servants. We have done that which is our duty to do. Well, listen, tonight, offenses. Have you offended somebody? The Lord said, woe, woe unto you. Woe unto that person through whom the offense came. You, are you a stumbling block to somebody else? I hope not. You need to get that matter settled. Maybe you need to go to the offender. Verses 3 and 4, offender or offended. You, got, you were offended by the offender. They're coming to you. 
they're reaching out to you and saying, I am sorry, I, please forgive me. Um, you're supposed to forgive them. You're supposed to forgive them. Then the disciple said, increase our faith, because that's really tough to do. Yeah, people in an unforgiving spirit is one of the biggest challenges of dealing with people in churches and in ministry. And it's one of those things that will keep the lost from coming to know Christ because when they see Christians fighting and not getting along with each other, especially in localities where the population is lower and everybody knows everybody's business, it really does keep people away from Christ. They're, they're, they're amazed. They're just, they are sick and tired of hypocrisy. Claiming to be a Christ, a Christ-like one, a Christ one, and not living right. And lastly, is servant, being a servant tonight. The duty of a servant. So what's that? I'll close with this. You know what? We can't put God in debt to us. If you really think about what he did for us on the cross, Number one, we're not here now as believers to pay for that. You cannot. You can never pay for that. You couldn't do enough works to ever pay for that. But God is no debtor to anyone. We're indebted to him. We're indebted to him tonight. As I've said in a lot recently, I remind myself on a regular basis that God, listen, we got the best of the deal we're going to heaven. Many times believers fail God. He gets shortchanged. Believers don't even obey God. Isn't that sad? They don't even do their duty. Isn't that a sad thing? That happens, unfortunately. Well, listen, I hope tonight this message has been a help to you and a blessing to you. And Lord willing, next Wednesday evening, and we're beginning a new month next week, the month of November. How about that? And we'll pick it up, but again, we're not going to pick it up in verse 11. We've covered that. If you'd like, you can go look for the Sunday school list, and you'll see the 10 lepers. The 10 lepers. I talked about that on uh, Thanksgiving, Canadian Thanksgiving Sunday, about being thankful. And you can go back and go to that playlist for Sunday school or for... Uh, preaching and teaching playlist, and you'll see that. Well, amen. Let me close in prayer tonight. And again, all, uh, we just pray that God would help you and, and bless and use you, um, and that these words tonight, Lord, would not fall to the ground, that they would ha you would take these words, and God would do something great in your heart and life. And if you're not saved, please check out our website. The links are down below in the description. If you ever want to check in and Write me a message. Please do that. If you've got any questions, I don't know everything, but I know the answers are found in the Bible. All the answers. You give me the question, the answers are here. Amen. Let's pray. Father, again, thank you again for your word. Thank you for our time together. Now bless, Lord God, have your will and way be done. We pray, Father, that you would again speak to hearts, meet with needs. We pray for those who don't know you, Lord. Help them open their eyes and their heart to the gospel. Thank you again for your blessings tonight. Help us to apply these truths. And Lord God, we'll just thank you and praise you for we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you all.